Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. You know, one of the most ironic situations is Gabriel comes to Muhammad, who, whom I think is a representative of Satan himself, this fake Gabriel, this uh, counterfeit Gabriel with the, the counterfeit God, Allah, um, and offers Muhammad the same things that he offered Jesus. And uh, what did Muhammad do? Well, he took him up on that offer, right? He became to, he started to go out and conquer and um, you know, have multiple wives, child brides included. He says that adultery is wrong, except if your cat, if it's a captive or a slave girl. I'm having such a hard time wrapping my head around this this notion of the Gnostics, the Freemasons, this secondary layer of of the truth that is preserved in some sort of oral tradition surrounding Jesus. I mean, uh, that's just really, really, really bad historical um, understanding of coming to the truth of the matter, right? Like the most well-known fact in history is that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was killed and crucified by the Roman precept Pontius Pilate. His followers wholeheartedly and were willing to face a tremendous amount of persecution believed that he rose on the third day. Um, the Christian mission um, spread from a very small amount of followers peacefully, and they... Um, and they made it out into the entire world, right? And then 600 years later, a thousand kilometers away, um, this uh, celebrated illiterate person decides that he doesn't like the story of Jesus being killed. So he makes up some Gnostic version where, um, you know, he's saved and rescued. And he says that Christians are in doubt uh, about it. Um, no, Christians are not in doubt about it. We know it was Jesus on the cross. The Islamic version of this man, they have no clue. It was either just someone was made to appear like him. It was Simon of Cyrene, maybe. It was one of Jesus' youngest followers. Um, it was uh, Judas, perhaps, that was on the cross. Like, who's, who's, who's in doubt about it? Well, it's the Muslims who are in doubt about it, right? There's been no falter or folly on the lines of... The Christians, right? But today's question had to do with whether or not Jesus was was Lucifer. Um, he was in the same place at the same time as Lucifer recorded it, uh, recorded in Matthew and Luke. He's having a conversation with Satan. Satan is offering him food, offering him power, um, and all of these types of things. And Jesus refuses it, saying that um, you know you should not tempt the Lord your God, and uh, you should worship Him and follow Him alone. You know, one of the most ironic situations is Gabriel comes to Muhammad, who, whom I think is a representative of Satan himself, this fake Gabriel, this uh, counterfeit Gabriel with the, the counterfeit God, Allah, um, and offers Muhammad the same things that he offered Jesus. 
And uh, what did Muhammad do? Well, he took him up on that offer, right? He became to he started to go out and conquer and um, you know have multiple wives, child brides included. He says that adultery is wrong, except if your cat if it's a captive or a slave girl. Um, you know, it's it's very obvious to me that you can tell the fruits of a person, um, you know, and what the spirit is that is is leading them, right? So when we read about Jesus in the actual gospels, not these Gnostic gospels, we see someone who is diametrically opposite of Satan. We see a humble person, right? We see a selfless person. We see a giving and kind person, right? Who teaches his followers to do the same thing, to put themselves in a state of humility so that they can uplift those who are actually in need. He even says things like to love your enemies. None of those things, from my opening statement, none of those things were addressed. Um, clearly, clearly, and most obviously, Jesus is at the very least an amazing person, right? And who he really is, is an amazing person who is indwelled by the Logos, the eternal Logos, the Son who is the eternally emitted from the Father alongside with the Holy Spirit. That is who Christ is, who came to earth as a humble servant and gave himself as an atoning sacrifice for de the deliverance of all mankind if they would just gaze upon him as the Israelites gazed upon the serpent lifted up on a pole in the wilderness. Because God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, not to condemn the world, but to forgive it. So I pray that all of you watching, that Mr. Brown, that you find Christ and you submit to him so that you too can find your way to the Father because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Alhamdulillah, of course, but the question Allah is to tempt her fire. A good Muslim submits to Allah. Islam is the perfect religion. Your Bible is corrupt and you worship a dead God. Do you know that Muhammad was a feminist? This ought to be good. Yes, I know. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum, mahi mahi, barakuda. Alhamdulillah that you... Let me tell you about one of the most convincing proofs of them all. The man of men, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the greatest person to ever live. Sure, according to the Quran, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, sallallahu wasallam, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, sallallahu. Do I have to keep saying? But Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is still pretty special. I am your host, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon me. And with me now is the one who gave me all of my revelations, all of my special moral privileges, including the right to violate my own commands. He is the angel Gabriel. So happy to see you again. Happy to be here, Prophet Muhammad. And may I add, well done, my most faithful servant. Such a blessing to hear that from an angel of the great God Allah. You're doing such an amazing job that I'm going to give you another dozen wives and 20 more sex slaves. Oh, angel Gabriel, you spoil me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, I've never had this happen before. It's like we're... BFFs or something. <laughs> Any and all Gentile kingdoms that think that they have a chance against God are going to be destroyed ultimately by the kingdom of God that are going to take place. Because at the tribulation, the Bible talks about false prophets, false pastors. And everybody, everybody 
has the thinking that my pastor is a really good pastor who loves God. God put up with that 2,000 years for you. That's long enough. Amen. It's about time that he passes on judgment. Amen. Because when the time of wrath comes, boy, my friend, you better work it out at that time. So how do you know the difference? Uh, the difference, I think, comes from the scripture back in Deuteronomy, Steve, that says that uh, anyone who comes speaking in the name of the God of heaven should be pointing people to the, the word of God and to the law of God and to the commandments of God. And That's any, right. any other standard uh, shows that they're not of God. You want to tell the difference? Are they teaching the commandments of God? Are they teaching the truth of God? Are they pointing to themselves? Are they pointing to God? That's going to be the key. The key is their focus. And if they don't speak to the law and the prophets, the scripture says there is no light in them. So the answer, you can tell the difference. But look to God, look to his law, and don't look to miracles as a sign of faith or positive ultimate truth. and spend in the way of Allah from what we have provided you before death approaches one of you and he says my lord if only you would delay me for a brief term so I would give charity and be among the righteous He's talking about how the Gentiles were duped into worshiping Jesus Christ. And he starts to cite the Gnostics. Um, anytime someone does intelligent uh, research into history about the, the actual person of Jesus Christ, um, they don't look at later legendary accounts. They look at the earliest historical accounts, which are um, obviously well attested to in the Bible itself and the New Testament, which are the earliest writings about the life and teachings of Jesus written by eyewitnesses or people who knew eyewitnesses um, to the living Christ after the time of the apostles and the people who knew the apostles. For Jesus historicists, it's often common to cite the references to Jesus in Josephus. Josephus is a very famous Jewish historian who actually lived in the first century, from 37 to 100 CE. Mythicists have been asking for contemporary accounts of a historical Jesus and Josephus seems to be a popular place to look. 
Josephus actually wasn't a contemporary, but I guess they figure it's close enough. The Jesus that most people talk about, of course, is the one that was born around the year 0 and died around the year 33. Josephus does mention Jesus, or actually multiple Jesuses, but none of his authentic writing references the Jesus that all Christians know and love. I've often said in videos that nothing about these books shouts eyewitness testimony. The Gospel writers did not claim to be eyewitnesses. They also don't even read like eyewitness testimony. There are simply too many phrases and narrative tools that suggest non-first-hand authorship. In addition to that, none of the Gospel accounts even tell us who the author is. They are never explicitly identified. Our best manuscripts of these Gospels contain the word kata in the title, meaning according to. This is not something we find in first-hand accounts of anything at the time. According to signifies later authorship. The other problem is that historians have no way of evaluating prophecy claims, or, for that matter, miraculous claims of any kind. We can solve anything with magic and come up with any answer we want. That's not how history is done. Scholars have known for a long time that Matthew was just a rewrite of Mark. The Gospel contains entire paragraphs copying Mark's Greek verbatim. That's no accident. Matthew's Gospel is also written completely in the third person, about what they, Jesus and the disciples, were doing, never about what we, Jesus and the rest of us, were doing. Even when this Gospel narrates the events of Matthew being called to become a disciple, it talks about him, not about me. Just take a look at Matthew 9.9. 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. There's not a thing here that would make you suspect the author is talking about himself. This gospel probably came some ten years after Mark and was certainly not written by an eyewitness. Luke is supposedly a companion of Paul. From the very beginning, it should be abundantly clear that the author of this is not Luke. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Luke 1, 1 1-2 If you didn't catch that, the author is telling you that he is writing long after these events, and he is recording the information that has been passed down to him. John was seen as the beloved one, or the one who Jesus loved, but this qualifier gives us the information we need to conclude he didn't write this gospel. At the end of the Gospel, the author says of the beloved disciple, This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and has written them, and we know that his testimony is true. John 21, 24. Note how the author differentiates between his source of information, the disciple who testifies, and himself. We know that his testimony is true. This author is not the disciple. He claims to have gotten some of his information from the disciple. The authors of the Gospels are not the people whose names are attributed to them. The Gospels were written anonymously and by people who were clearly not eyewitnesses. And then we do not start to get Gnostic texts until about a hundred years or so after Christ's death, after the time of the apostles and the people who knew the apostles. The people who knew the apostles. The reason I, I am now convinced there's no historical Jesus, which seems a real, like, whoa, to people who are not familiar with the idea, is a combination of things. First of all, 
there is no evidence for an historical man which stands up to proper scrutiny. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. For anyone to think that the Gnostic texts are more reliable than the actual historical biblical texts, that's just crazy. So we're going to start by reading Daniel chapter 7 and 25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High. And we know that this he right here is talking about a kingdom, right? This is talking about a kingdom. It's this kingdom today. And shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. Why, why does the Bible say think to change times and laws? Think. And it says to ponder, to go over in one's head. So, your thought is not your reality. Meaning, this kingdom would change our perception of what time is. They did not change time, they changed the way you think about time. That's all they did, they changed your perception. Right? That's why they can do all of these things. How can you, okay, let's look at the calendar. Let's look at... This is going into the Roman. The, the Gregorian calendar, right? The calendar was developed as a correction to the Julian calendar. Remember, Russia and those places back then, they were using the Julian calendar. In the Americas, the Gregorian, the, the Gregorian. Shortening the average year by 0 0.0075 days <laughs> to stop the drift of the calendar with respect to the equinoxes. To deal with the 10 days difference mark that part we're going to go back to it to deal with the 10 days difference between calendar and reality you see there's a big difference between what we call calendar today in this you know under this roman empire as opposed to calendar in reality there is that statement in the gospel of luke that when jesus appeared in public he was about 30 years old. So if Jesus is 30 in 29 CE, this suggests the year of 1 BCE as a possible birth date. Jesus would need to be at least three years older to have lived in the time of Herod the Great, or seven years younger to be subjected to the Roman census. Therefore, at least a decade's discrepancy is evident within Luke's conflicting versions of events. And it turns out that this is a very, very insidious tool. You probably never thought that a calendar could be so evil. But what this calendar has done is it has pinned our civilization's consciousness to physical evidence only. The Gregorian calendar went out with the Spanish and with the Catholic bishops, and they conquered lands and then told people what day it was. 
most civilizations already had their own calendar, see? And then these guys come along and say, ah, ah, no. This is the day. It didn't go down very easy. They had to kill millions and millions of people to get them to follow this Gregorian calendar. Notice in this part when you take away 4 from 15 you get 11 So this is talking about the 11 days difference, but up there it says to deal with the 10 days difference The reform also alter the lunar cycle. Hold on. The Gregorian is supposed to be a solar calendar What does it have to do with the lunar? That's the first question <laughs> that means that Gregorian calendar is fake, right? It's fake because it's supposed to only be about the sun and we know you don't get months from the sun so this anyone who uses either you call it Gregorian or solar that's totally out of the picture all right that's fake that's that has nothing to do with the Bible that has nothing to do with the most high that's out that's hundred percent pagan the reform also altered the lunar cycle used by the church to calculate the date for Easter. You see why they use this? What's the psychology behind all of this? Because they need the moon to dictate when is the time for Passover. Right? They use the word Easter here, but guess what? They use their strong wine or their strong influences to push the so-called Easter directly where Passover falls so they can push Passover out of the way and the whole world would be celebrating Easter in the f um, in the first moon of the year so no longer it's Passover in the first moon but guess what it is it's Easter they did the same thing to our feast of lights Hanukkah right Hanukkah was supposed to be about the, the lighting of the altar but what do they do? They don't celebrate Hanukkah. They push Christmas. They take a tree, they deck it with lights. It's the same thing. They have to do that to push the biblical feast days out of the way. Right? The Bible calls it holy days, meaning set apart days. What did they do? They changed the Y to I and call it what? Holiday. Because we know the year goes by 12 moons. And 12 moons cannot get you cannot count 365 daylight period in 12 moons that only exists on the calendar and that's why it says the difference with the calendar and reality mention about the calendar and reality because they are two different things right can you remove a physical day no you can't because to remove a physical day you'd have to remove the Sun so that's why the scripture said think to change times and laws but that wasn't only th that wasn't the only effect of the time zone shift alaska ended up losing one of the 12 days it's gained it gained moving to october 18th instead of the 19th and it also lost a day of the week in the process instead of going from friday the 6th to saturday the 19th it went from friday to friday how the hell you have two days two of the same days back to back does that make any sense right so these are things if once you know these these things where you know one nation conquer this nation they change they they govern them they change the timing all of these things and what you have to understand is the whole point of this inter international dateline it is all political it's political it has nothing to do with the most high it's about the merchants of the earth that's all it's just a group of men men who wants to run their businesses this and that it's all about commerce and we know who controls the world through its commerce we know who it is the story of jesus is full of these motifs 
which come from the pagan mysteries. And the third reason is because in the early Christian movement, there's these two types of Christians, certainly by the second century, which I think of as Gnostics and literalists. What marks out the literalists who will become the Roman Empire and the Roman Catholic Church is that they've got an historical man. What marks out the Gnostics is that they see it allegorically, and their great heresy is that Christ didn't come in the flesh. Now, the winners write history, and the history books have been written by the literalists. So, voila, here I am, the modern version of the fake Jesus. <laughs> Got you again. Right? Like the most well known fact in history is that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was killed and crucified by the Roman precept Pontius Pilate. His followers wholeheartedly and were willing to face a tremendous amount of persecution believed that he rose on the third day. A famous example is uh, Matthew 27 when Jesus is crucified and these, uh, the graves are opened up and these, these people uh, rise from the dead and they start walking around in Jerusalem, uh, which is often seen as one of the weirder passages in the uh, New Testament and kind of hard to figure out. And uh, <laughs> really, I mean, so I mean, these are like zombie figures or something. Presumably they die again. And it's like, what? Uh, I mean, so much, you know, of course, I mean, there, there are a lot of even evangelicals who will say that, you know, okay, that's, that's like, it's not really literal. Okay, that's, I'm, I am so pleased with that. I'm happy with that. It's fine. It's not literal. If you don't think that's literal, why do you think other passages are literal? For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that one defies probability. Okay, how about walking on the water? Does that defy probability? No, 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 you can do that. You can do that? Let me see you do that. Well, Jesus could do that. Yeah, of course, because God empowered him. But God could empower these people to rise from the dead and walk around Jerusalem. So if you're going to say this one didn't happen, why do you say that one did happen? On what grounds do you say that? For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. When trying to reason with biblical literalists, they'll say that their Bible is historically accurate even though the best they can show is that only some of the people and places mentioned in those fables were real, which of course they would be, since fictional stories are usually set in real places and often mention famous people of that time. But there is absolutely no historical or archaeological evidence that the stories are true, and biblical scholars often admit that they're evidently not true. Believers might also argue that the Bible is scientifically accurate even though the earth is not flat, there is no firmament. The sun is just another star. Snakes and donkeys can't talk. Whales are not fish, and bats are neither birds nor locusts. There was never a global flood either, nor could there have been. Everything the Bible says about any field of science is laughably and indefensibly wrong.
So here, here's my, back to my personal story. When I started seeing these things, I started freaking out. Ah, uh, how can there be mistakes in the Gospels? This is, like, this is the Word of God. And I, I was comforted by the idea that um, St. Augustine propounded, to paraphrase, uh, that if there's anything that's true, it comes from God. God is the God of truth, which means all truth is God's truth. If something's true, it's from God. If it's true that there are contradictions in the Gospels, then that's true, and that means it comes from God. That was my thinking at the time, and uh, I'm no longer a believer, but I still think that that's the right attitude. You don't have to be afraid of the truth simply because it's going to make you change your mind about something, even if that something is near and dear to you. You should follow the truth no matter what. And I'm not going to concede that we should stick to our guns no matter what. Whatever you've been brought up to think, whatever you've been taught, whatever, we should not stick to our guns because we just can't give it up. When it comes to anything involving the intellect, you can give it up. If logic, reason, truth, takes you in a different direction. You should follow the truth. Don't necessarily follow what you've always thought. And at a point, you just start saying, you know, maybe there are some differences that can't be reconciled. And if you can't reconcile the differences, they can't be all historically reliable. And maybe that doesn't matter to you which is fine, I mean, if it doesn't matter to you. Uh, it's fine, but uh, you shouldn't say then that every word in here is accurate, because it's not. The most well-known fact in history is that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was killed and crucified by the Roman precept Pontius Pilate. There are people who think the Bible should be taken literally. Those people haven't even read the first pages. Who's, who's, who's in doubt about it? Well, there's been no falter or folly on the lines of the Christians. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. God hasn't even made the sun yet. That's not until verse 14. So, so where is this light coming from? And how do we get evening and morning when there's no sun? Also, darkness isn't a separate but equal thing. Darkness is the absence of light, just like cold is the absence of heat. Those aren't two different things, they are different amounts of one thing. But how do you make plants that bear fruit and vegetation when you can't have photosynthesis because, again, there's no sun? And the idea that the greater light, the sun, governs the day while the moon governs the night doesn't make sense either. It's not like the sun goes away at night. That's what toddlers think. But wait, the moon is described as a lesser light. And if you know anything about the moon, it's that it doesn't give off light. It reflects light from the sun. So what is the Bible talking about? Also, the sun and the moon were not created at the same time. And God supposedly made these two lights to separate light from darkness. But God also did that back in verse 4. So did he just separate light from darkness twice? The fourth day. Well, at least we have a sun now. It took four days to get the actual first day.
And then 600 years later, a thousand kilometers away, um, this uh, celebrated illiterate person decides that he doesn't like the story of Jesus being killed. So he makes up some Gnostic version where, um, you know, he's saved and rescued. And, and there's going to be so many healings that are going to take place under the anti-Messiah. People are going to think it's a good thing. He's going to heal those that are sick. He's going to heal those with cancer. Some people think he's even going to be raised from the dead. There's an obscure scripture in the book of Revelation that some interpret as being he's going to die and be raised back to life, that people are going to think this is God. Brother. They have denied that which they encompass not in knowledge, and whose interpretation has not yet come to them. You know, one of the most ironic situations is Gabriel comes to Muhammad, who, whom I think is a representative of Satan himself, this fake Gabriel, this... Uh, counterfeit Gabriel with the, the counterfeit God, Allah. This describes the night that Muhammad began receiving revelations. When it was the night on which God honored him with his mission and showed mercy on his servants thereby, Gabriel brought him the command of God. He came to me, said the apostle of God, while I was asleep with a coverlet of brocade whereupon was some writing and said, read. I said, what shall I read? He pressed me with it so tightly that I thought it was death. Then he let me go and said, read. I said, what shall I read? He pressed me with it again uh, so that I thought it was death. Then he let me go and said, read. I said, what shall I read? He pressed me with it the third time so that I thought it was death and said, read. I said, what then shall I read? And this I said only to deliver myself from him, lest he should do the same to me again. Mm. He said, read in the name of thy Lord who created, who created uh, man of blood coagulated, Read, thy Lord is the most beneficent, who taught by the pen, taught that which he knew not unto men. So I read it, and he departed from me, and I woke from my sleep, and it was as though these words were written on my heart. Here's the important point. When Muhammad ran out of that cave, terrified, he didn't think that he had encountered the angel Gabriel. He believed that he was possessed. Um, and offers Muhammad the same things that he offered Jesus. And uh, what did Muhammad do? Well, he took him up on that offer, right? He became to he started to go out and conquer and, um, you know, have multiple wives, child brides included. He says that adultery is wrong, except if your cat, if it's a captive or a slave girl. I don't believe it. Well, look at right here, Acts chapter 16, verse 16. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination. Now, we all know that that woman is demon-possessed. Now, that woman is satanic. Which brought her masters much gain by Sue's saying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. What? What? Why would Satan proclaim the gospel, the right gospel? Why would Satan proclaim the gospel, the right gospel?
he says that Christians are in doubt uh, about it. Um, no, Christians are not in doubt about it. We know it was Jesus on the cross. The Muslims call him Dajjal. He is the great deceiver. He comes to earth on a mule and he's blind in one eye. He is an infidel. He is a false miracle worker, this Antichrist, this Islamic Antichrist. But you know who he claims to be? He claims to be Jesus, the Son of God. He claims to be deity. He will attempt to stop the Mahdi and the true Jesus, but the true Jesus will slaughter Him. This is their view of the true Christ. Our Jesus is their Antichrist. Our Antichrist is their Redeemer. Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. Which you have heard was coming. And is now already in the world. And is now already in the world and is now already in the world and is now already in the world i just find it so ironic the projection the christians don't know they're in doubt about it no we're not i don't i don't recall any christians being in doubt about the death and resurrection of yeah. christ i don't even recall any modern historians or scholars or textual Correct. critics being in doubt about his. The devil will masquerade around the world as Almighty God. Billions of people will see him perform miracles, amazing miracles, signs and wonders. Billions of people will fall down and worship him, believing that he's Almighty God. One of the most famous prophecies that Jesus makes is about the coming of someone he refers to as the Son of Man. Now many people believe that he's talking about a second coming of himself. And many people believe that this is going to occur some point in the future. Jesus makes very specific prophecies as to what will happen when the Son of Man makes his visitation. They definitely wanted this character to be seen as having been a Messiah and having existed in the past, so he'd already come, rather than everyone looking for him to show up, and that he was killed by the Jews. With Christianity, the Flavians hoped to create docile, tax-paying subjects who did not need a standing army over them to maintain order. In the future, Christians would pay their taxes to the pontiff, which was simply another name for Caesar. The Flavians were proud of their invention and encoded into the Gospels 
a message to posterity. It's got a very simple message, just believe this, you don't have to transform, and you have to go through the authorities, through the bishops, through the state, ultimately. It's the perfect thing for them to pick up, and that's what they did. Christians are in doubt uh, about it. Um, no, Christians are not in doubt about it. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So when we read about Jesus in the actual gospels, not these Gnostic gospels, we see someone who is diametrically opposite. We see a humble person, right? We see a selfless person. We see a giving and kind person. His followers wholeheartedly and were willing to face a tremendous amount of persecution, believed that he rose on the third day. Um, the Christian mission um, spread from a very small amount of followers peacefully. Christian mission um, spread from a very small amount of followers peacefully peacefully an amazing person an amazing right amazing person right an amazing person right get over here peacefully get over here peacefully an amazing person right get over right here. right 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 an amazing person right right peacefully get over here. right an Peace amazing right. person right right get over here. right <laughs> Right? <laughs> we see a humble person, right? Get over here. Right? Right? Peacefully. An amazing person, right? We see a humble person, right? We see a selfless person. We see a giving and kind person, right? Peacefully. Yeah! An amazing person, a right? Humble person, right? right? We see a selfless right? person. Right? Right? We see a giving right? Right? and kind person. Person, right? Right, 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 The Christian mission um, spread from a very small amount of followers peacefully. Spread from a very small amount of followers peacefully. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees! Hypocrites all! Peacefully. For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men! You do not go in yourselves, nor do you let others enter. Blind guides! Peacefully. You strain at a gnat! 
and swallow a camel peacefully. You bow before the letter of the law and violate the heart of the law peacefully. Justice, mercy, good faith. You are like whited sepulchres, all clean and fair without, but within. Full of dead men's bones and all corruption. Peacefully. You see these stones, do you not? I tell you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Yours is a house of desolation. The home of the lizard and the spider. Peacefully. Serpents. Brood of vipers! Peacefully! How can any of you escape damnation? Peacefully! He is a blasphemer! Peacefully! This is the man! White dead Back You have forsaken the Lord! And now you despise the Holy One of Israel! You don't speak for the people of Israel! Peacefully! Listen to the teachings of our God! Remember the Peacefully. So when we read about Jesus in the actual Gospels, not these Gnostic Gospels, we see someone who is diametrically opposite. In chapter 16, verse 2, this is in, on Thursday evening in the upper room, they'll make outcasts from the synagogues of you. They will kill you thinking they are offering service to God. So it has to be a power that is worldwide, has to be a power that has led people contrary to Scripture, and three, it has to be a power that has persecuted. And history tells us this is exactly what has happened. I mean, all you've got to do is go back and read. Read about such things as the uh, massacre of St. Bartholomew. Read about the Spanish Inquisition. The Inquisition of the Dutch. And history will tell you this. The Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind. Will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. And I mentioned this the other night when I was speaking about it. Pope John Paul II made a public apology for all they had done lives of people they have taken by the millions over the years.
we see a giving and kind person, right? He even says things like to love your enemies. If God is love, how can Christians explain the silence and indifference of the church and most Christian nations while six million Jews were being gassed and burned by the Germans? Why the stone-like silence during the Six-Day War? Where was Christian love during the Spanish Inquisition and the hundreds of pogroms inspired by priests and monks? Spread from a very small amount of followers peacefully who teaches his followers to do the same thing, to put themselves in a state of humility so that they can uplift those who are actually in need. He and he turned and he said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. right? Like the most well-known fact in history is that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was killed and crucified by the Roman precept Pontius Pilate. Christians are not in doubt about it. We know it was Jesus on the cross. Like Bart Ehrman says famously, he says, if Jesus was crucified, he existed. And since we know he was crucified, he obviously existed, and all those who say he didn't exist are just wrong. The most well-known fact in history is that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was killed and crucified by the Roman precept Pontius Pilate. And I know your Christian church and your Christian pastor has taught you about the cross and has spoon-fed you that for how many years now? Because some people try to say, oh, well, the Messiah being hung on a tree is not scriptural, is not biblical. Well, that is not true because here we are giving you at least four different scriptures that prove that he was in fact hung on a tree. We cannot approach this from a westernized, Hellenized, Grecian, European, Eurocentric mind. We have to approach this from a Yaudith, Hebraic mind. Acts chapter 13, verse 29, this says, And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. So where did they take him down from? From the tree. It does not say cross. It says tree. And then also 1 Peter 2 verse 24 that says here, Who his own self bear our transgressions in his own body on the tree that we being dead to transgression should have kaya or life unto righteousness. Do we focus on the part right here that says what? Tree. It does not say cross. It says tree right there. Mashiach hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Now we've gone over this passage right here and how important it really is and significant and what your translators tried to do and how much has been twisted, how much has been added and taken out of scripture, which they were not supposed to do, and also the truth concerning Paul altogether. But then it goes on to say, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree.
All right, so if we just proven with the so-called New Testament that indeed the Messiah was in fact hung on a tree and that they took him down from a tree, where do we get the word cross from? Where does the cross come from? Because then some people are saying, all right, but then the New Testament so-called also says cross in the KJV in places and common places such as Matthew 16, 24, where it says take up his cross. But did it originally say that? Because when we go to the Greek and here we are in Strong's Concordant, it's the Greek 4716, which is the Greek word staros. You see right here that the definition is an upright stake. So the original word should be stake and not cross. So it should say take up his stake. Well, then the question becomes, well, what is a stake according to scripture? And what is the scriptural definition and understanding of a stake? Because that's where we're going to get some clarity from this word origins. If you keep scrolling down right here, we'll go right here. It says, upright stake. So even according back then to certain words and etymologies, we see that it is in fact a stake. We know it was Jesus on the cross. They put a beam into the ground and a piece of wood jutted from it. Then the two hands were brought together and it was hanged. It's interesting they use it here. And they let it down at once. If it remained there overnight, a negative command was thereby transgressed, for it is written, quote, His body shall not remain all night upon a tree, but thou shalt surely bury him the same day, for that is hanged is a curse of God. We know it was Jesus on the cross. But if you keep reading further, you'll see right here the word staros. It says here they call it a cross piece, but that's what they added. And you're going to find out why the wicked translators did all this adding and taking away, why they took out the original definition of an upright stake and then added the cross because of what? We know it was Jesus on the cross. We see that indeed he was pierced and nailed on a tree and in fact died on a tree and was hung on a tree. Well, then where does all of this cross come from? And could it have been a perversion of Rome, Rome pushing certain things. Because notice with the tree, you have what? Something very reminiscent to what? The tree of Kaya, the tree of life. And tree represents Kaya. It represents life. It is a living thing. It is living. But with the cross, where do you normally see crosses? You see them where? They represent and are attributed to the dead. You see them in cemeteries. The cross is a form of idolatry and it breaks the second commandment, which is what? No graven images. And we've talked about in previous videos that you can find in the playlist, like the Be Deceived No More playlist, about the pagan origins of the cross and how the cross is rooted in Babylonian origin, Egyptian origin. It's a pagan origin going all the way back to the worship of Tammuz that's found in Yakazakal or Ezekiel 8, verse 12 through 16. The letter T is the first initial of the Sun deity Tammuz. We know it was Jesus on the cross. That's why you see the cross embedded in all these different religions and all these different cultures as we talked about. You see it with the Egyptian cross. So yes, during the time of Egypt, because nothing new is under the sun, in ancient Egypt they had crosses too. Ankhs plastered all over the place. Just like in Celtic regions, the Latin one of course, you even see it in ancient Buddhism and Hinduism religions as well. They don't like the story of Jesus dying on the cross because they lack any ability to think deeper than two inches so But understand, if you read Ibn Kathir, then it's the youngest companion said, hey, pick me. And Jesus said, okay, buddy, off you go. And this guy insisted. And then they picked him and they put his face on him and then they killed him. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, who, and then you have Judas. And in other versions, it's Judas who was punished. Uh -huh. I mean, understand, yep. they can't make up their own minds. I mean, it's just a mess. Or is this Simon, Simon of Serene, too, you know, so they, they literally don't know. I just find it so ironic, the projection. The Christians don't know. They're in doubt about it. No, we're not. I don't rec I don't recall any Christians being in doubt about the death and resurrection of yeah. Christ. I don't even recall any modern historians or scholars or textual Correct. critics being in doubt about his
the Islamic version of this man, they have no clue. It was either just someone was made to appear like him. It was Simon of Cyrene, maybe. It was one of Jesus' youngest followers. Um, it was uh, Judas, perhaps, that was on the cross. Like, who's 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 in doubt about it? Well, it's the Muslims who are in doubt about it. is not Jesus. What? The false image of the Messiah, Christ, the most common images seen in many homes and churches, is the image of Caesar Borgia, son of Pope Alexander VI, who employed Leonardo da Vinci, his son Caesar's gay lover, to paint Caesar as the Christ. Last time you saw me, I actually came clean and told you that I wasn't the real Jesus. I also told you that I was created to make certain populations happy and comfortable. Well, I am glad to see that many of you are loyal and enjoy strong delusions and still want me as your savior. <laughs> wow, what idiots! A basic view of Islam and Christ. They said in boast, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. But they killed him not, nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear. But it seemed mm -hmm. to them. But another was made to resemble him in other translations. Another was made to resemble him. And those who differ therein are full of doubts with no knowledge, but only mm. conjecture to follow. For of a surety, they killed him not. No, it's biscuits. The man of lawlessness is the dreaded Antichrist. Lucifer will appear to be a glorious man, but he will be a demon wearing a garment of glorious light. The greatest deception to ever occur on earth will soon take place, and Christians, by and large, do not have a clue. To start the Bible, to make their assertion work, and he's also known throughout the scripture as Lucifer, Satan, that ancient serpent, the devil himself. The devil will masquerade around the world as Almighty God. Billions of people will see him perform miracles, amazing miracles, signs and wonders. Billions of people will fall down and worship him, believing that he's Almighty God. Few people know the second karagma will be a literal name on the literal foreheads of literal people. Christians are in doubt uh, about it. Um, no, Christians are not in doubt. cross of ash traced on their foreheads. This powerful symbol what? reminds us that we don't live forever. By receiving the cross of ash, we acknowledge our human frailty and our dependence upon God's healing grace. The 40 days us on our Christian pilgrimage what? for reflection. Christians are in doubt uh, about it. Um, no, Christians are not in doubt. What? 
Let's go to Revelation 13, starting at verse 16. The Bible says, He, speaking of the beast, also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. The name which Lucifer will use, presently known. the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Verse 18, this calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is a man's number. His number is 666. There is no need. Allah knows best in your scholars and missionaries are liars. He's blind in the right eye. It looks like a bulging grip. <laughs> the karagma will either be the number 666, or the karagma will be the name of the beast, which will be tattooed on the foreheads of wicked people. Summarizing, we have two different places for the karagma, the right hand, the forehead. And we have two different karagmas, the number 666 and the name which the beast will use. What is embarrassing is your god was cursed on a tree. That's embarrassing. You're just mad because I've busted you. I've busted your pagan beliefs. I've given you proof you have been defeated. Allahu Akbar! And with all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived all the people who belonged to this world. He ordered the people of the world to make a great statue of the first beast, who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. Um, no, Christians are not in doubt about it. We know it was Jesus on the cross. He deceived all the people who belong to this world. No, it's biscuits. He ordered the people of the world to make a great statue of the first beast, who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. Uh, so, because I worship Jesus as God, God, because, well, he is God, uh, you as a Muslim believe that I will burn in hell for eternity because you believe that I'm committing shirk. Is that correct? The lying missionary cutter have gotten to you. Or the dirty rotten orientalists. Alhamdulillah, of course, but the question Allah is to tempt her fire. You! You are the liar! You and those evil missionaries! Allah knows best! Allah is the knower of all things! Christian mission um, spread from a very small amount of followers peacefully
I simply don't trust you to be any different than the God that you worship, who himself claimed to be the best of deceivers. But today's question had to do with whether or not Jesus was, was Lucifer. Um, he was in the same place at the same time as Lucifer recorded, uh, recorded in Matthew and Luke. He's having a conversation with Satan. Satan is offering him food, offering him power, um, and all of these types of things. And Jesus refuses it, saying that, um, you know, you should not tempt the Lord your God. The world does not anticipate this coming event, and the world will not be able to escape the devil's capture of the world. Lucifer will eventually rule over the inhabitants of earth with absolute power. Paul goes on in verse 9. He says, The coming of the lawless one will be divinely glorious and awesome to behold. I've inserted those words. But in full accordance with the work of Satan, displayed how? In all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. When the man of sin, when the man of lawlessness appears, he will appear to be divinely glorious and awesome. But he comes with all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. He will appear to be one thing, but his actions are something else. Um, no, Christians are not in doubt about it. We know it was Jesus. And on the in cross. every sort, verse 10, of evil that deceives those who are perishing. Now follow this carefully. They, that is the wicked, the rebellious, perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Friends, you can't refuse something you haven't heard. The wicked here who are perishing are not perishing because of something they are ignorant of, no. They refused. That means they had a chance to hear the gospel. They refused to love the truth and so be saved. The best of deceivers. Verse 11, for this reason, God sends them a powerful God delusion. God sends them a powerful delusion. God sends them a powerful God delusion. God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the best of deceivers. They will believe the lie. They will think that he's almighty God. And so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. So the answer to why God permits the devil to physically appear is now clear. The wicked will perish because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. And so it's because of the rebellion that God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will be the, believe the lie and be condemned. The best of deceivers. God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will be the, believe the lie and be condemned. Seventh-day Adventists generally believe that Lucifer will physically appear on earth before Christ returns but they do not have a single Bible text from Daniel or Revelation to support this belief. They don't have a single Bible text in Daniel or Revelation indicating the physical appearing of Lucifer masquerading as Almighty God and leading the world into destruction. This is very, very strange. Because some of the Adventists have focused on the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church, they have totally missed the most profound point in Bible prophecy. The man, that is the second beast in Revelation 13, is not a pope. The man in Revelation 13 is a fallen angel who has been alive already for thousands of years. He was once a covering cherub in heaven. He was in Eden. He is a highly intelligent, an unbelievably sophisticated demon, extremely cunning. So let's summarize the first three biblical reasons showing that the mark of the beast has nothing to do with the Roman Catholic Church or the Pope. And this second beast in Revelation 13 is nothing more than a fallen angel attended by billions of demons. The second beast in Revelation 13 is a man 
But the man is not a pope or anyone born of a woman. Well, the Quran also says that semen is formed between the backbone and the ribs. So excuse me if I don't trust the Quran. All right, let me go down here. Uh, Hindu historian, uh, five Canadian dollars, said, I uh, just want to thank Nadir for helping demonstrate how hard it is to defend the Quran. Well, you know, I think this is going back to just mocking and ridiculing. Why? Because, you know, they're now just resorting to mocking and making fun. But I tell you what, if you really had a good argument, you know, that would have sealed the deal. You should be, you should be bringing up good arguments. And that's a very important story because it helps you to begin the process of understanding Arabic. It'll help you to see, oh, wow, these are words now used in the educated Quran. you on what the word is. That was now the brought up by the audience in Nadir's picture and asked that question. Mockery and ridicule, I tell you what. It's very, very clear. All right, keep, keep mocking, go ahead, keep it up. Yeah. <laughs> Allah says, semen is produced between the backbone and ribs. In the Quran, chapter 86, verses 5 to 7, Allah says, So let man consider from what he is created. He is created from a gushing fluid that issued from between the loins and ribs. The Quran states incorrectly that sperm originates somewhere from between the backbone and ribs. Today, we know from basic anatomy and physiology that sperm is produced in the testicles and semen from various glands below the bladder. The Quran is scientifically incorrect. It is very clear that the, that the Quran makes a scientific mistake in which it claims that sperm comes from between the backbones and ribs. And uh, it is just, there is just not very much that should be said about it. Every moment that we spend talking about it is a moment in defense of Islam. But every moment that we spend uh, talking about it is also really not in, not in favor of Islam because it is ridiculous. But please go ahead. But it, it, the question was for Nadir. So yeah, please, Nadir, be brief. <laughs> Is the vast difference between the backbone and the ribs, and it is absolutely the case. I've shown you the picture of it, and this is where the scene yeah. actually should go to. Everybody yeah. definitely should go look at Nadir's picture and ask that question. They yeah. Mockery should. and ridicule. I tell you what, it, 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 you know, you, it's, just, it's, it's, it's yeah. very, very clear. All right, keep, keep mocking. Go ahead, keep it up. Yeah. <laughs> Nonetheless, you'll get to see what it says here. So, let man see from what he is created. So, where is man created or woman created? Now, this is generic. He is created from a water gushing forth, proceeding be from between the backbone and the ribs. He is created from a water gushing forth, from a water gushing forth, from a water gushing forth, from a water gushing forth. He is created from a water gushing forth, proceeding be from between the backbone and the ribs. 
So when we look at the verse which is being quoted over there, semen is not used there. Mat, which is water, or actually translated as fluid, from between the backbone and the ribs. Quran, the Quran clearly says it comes from between the backbones and the ribs. The sperm, yes. the semen comes from between the backbones and the ribs. The semen never goes Water. there. The semen never goes okay. there. And the, the semen does not come from between the backbones and the ribs. That's that's not how biology, that is basic biology. We don't even need to go into fancy words. In this video, I'm going to talk about adrenal gland function. Now on the left kidney and the right kidney are these two little hats, and they're called the adrenal glands. So here are those four layers. I'll just label them G, F, R and M. Now they each produce different hormones. Now the zona glomerulosa produces aldosterone. The fasciculata produces cortisol. The reticularis produces sex steroids. And the medulla produces epinephrine. Now epinephrine and norepinephrine, the sex steroids are important for reproduction. The sex steroids are important for reproduction are important for reproduction, are important for reproduction in releasing sex steroids. Hair growth of the axillary region, the pubic region, the facial region, more facial for the male helps with sebaceous secretions of the hair and the certain types of skin, right? Also, it helps with their sex drive, their libido. For the female, same thing, libido, uh, axillary hair growth, pubic hair growth, and a little bit of development for the secondary sex characteristics, okay? Also, what does it help to do? It also helps with their sex drive via libido, right? So it helps with their sex drive, helps with different types of sebaceous
right? So when we read about Jesus in the actual gospel, we see someone who is diametrically opposite. Did Christ focus his teaching on a specific subject? You might be shocked to find that his gospel message wasn't just, take me into your heart and be saved. It's also startling to realize he didn't say, you're going to heaven when you die. If you're to understand the point of Jesus' teaching, his message, his mission, you need to be sure you understand the gospel, the good news, what Jesus himself actually proclaimed. It is vital to know what he preached. Do you know what is the message that Jesus brought and taught? Seems like a simple enough question, but most don't give it much thought. Did Jesus simply preach about himself? Did his primary message center only on him being the prophesied Savior? You need to know the surprising answers. So what was Jesus' message? In Luke 4.43, Christ in his own words described his purpose. I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns too, because that is why I was sent. His message was the good news of the kingdom of God. Do you know what Christ was talking about? This kingdom is the focus of Jesus' message, yet it's often been misunderstood or even ignored. Our earliest literature says they communicated only by revelations. So you have to realize that Jesus is not just anybody. And immediately people were talking about having conversations with him from heaven. Uh, this, is, this puts him in a different reference class altogether. Uh, it makes it more likely that he might not have been historical. He also states exactly when this individual will come. He says that the Son of Man will appear before the generation that is alive and listening to Jesus' words passes away. In their system, this man, this prophet Jesus, who is now in heaven, never having died, plays a key role in the end times, because he will return from heaven without dying. He will come back when Allah sends him back. Now the question to ask is, why would Allah want to send Jesus back? He has a lot of prophets to pick from. Why does He send Jesus back? Answer? so that when He shows up, He can correct all the Christians who have misunderstood who He is. Jesus does not come back with planes and guns and bombs to win the Battle of Armageddon. He comes back with the power of the Word of God and speaks the Word 
I don't know what that word is. Perhaps peace, be still, and it's over with. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. You know, it's, it's very obvious to me that you can tell the fruits of a person, um, you know, and what the spirit is that is, is leading them. What miracle can you perform to show us that you have the right to do this? Tear down this temple, and in three days I will build it again. Are you going to build it again in three days? It has taken 46 years to build this temple. There are people who actually think all of this came to pass in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., all of it. There are people who actually think that was the second coming. Look, that, that was a disaster, but what the Romans did there could not be described as something that occurred that was worse than anything that had occurred since the beginning of the creation. This can't describe some past event in one country by one army at one moment, and certainly doesn't do anything to explain the book of Revelation. If you take that view, let me tell you what happens when you get to Revelation. You are lost. You are hopelessly lost because you just can't explain any of that. This is going to be... An unparalleled time. It's so horrible that the Lord shortens it. Verse 20, unless the Lord had shortened those days, no life would have been saved. For the sake of the elect whom He chose, He shortened the days. Why? Because He has to keep them alive. Who were the Pharisees? Well, they were the religious leaders of the day. What did they do? They opposed Christ at every step and denied what He taught about the kingdom of God. They acted like enemies of Jesus. So what can we conclude? Christ was definitely not saying that the kingdom of God was in them. Well, what was He saying? Jesus was telling them that as the king of the kingdom of God, He was right there in their midst. He was expounding His message. But what did they do? They rejected Him and despised His gospel of the kingdom, and they downplayed His return as king. But what did they do? They rejected Him and despised His gospel of the kingdom, and they downplayed His return as king. And they downplayed His return as king. and they downplayed His return as king. The Mahdi, or the twelfth Imam, that means the guided one, is the long-awaited Savior. He is the establisher of the final caliphate. He will have an army. His army will be a massive army, and His army will go from nation to nation to punish the unbelievers. The holy writings of Islam say that this army will carry black flags, 
And on those black flags, there will be one word, and that one word will be the word punishment. And then He will establish His rule in Jerusalem on the temple mount. The Greek word there for coming is parousia. It is the standard word used by Jesus Himself in the Gospels, but also by Paul to talk about the second coming of Christ. It literally means presence, but it means He's going to return. He's going to be with us, present with us again. This is not like you'll see in those rapture movies where they're flying on an airplane and all of a sudden, you know, half the airplane quietly just disappears because they've been raptured. That's just... The rapture doctrine proposes a secret coming of Jesus to gather His true believers. What Paul's talking about here is a public coming of Jesus at the end of time. He's not talking about a secret coming and the you know, disappearance of true believers. He's talking about the final coming and the resurrection of all the dead in Christ. And he says, so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And this is easy to understand. If you look at the prophecies of Jesus in the Gospels, you can walk away from those prophecies. He's very clear. You don't know when the second coming is going to take place. So get ready, right? It's near. It's, I'm coming soon, you'll see in the book of Revelation. How soon? That remains a mystery. As we'll see when we come to the First Thessalonians 5, that because we don't know the day or hour, Christ could come at any moment, and therefore He could come soon. For anyone to think that the Gnostic texts are more reliable than the actual historical biblical texts, that's just crazy. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Their holy writings say this, the Mahdi will come riding on a white horse, and it even says in their writings, as it says in Revelation 6, 1 and 2. When the Mahdi arrives, he will discover hidden scriptures. He will discover them, interestingly enough, somewhere near the Sea of Galilee, and there will be there hidden scriptures, hidden gospels, and a hidden Torah. And they will be the true scriptures which will be used by the Mahdi to show the Jews and the Christians they were wrong, that their scriptures were the false scriptures. Let me summarize. The Mahdi will be a messianic figure. He will establish Islamic world headquarters at Jerusalem. He will rule for seven years, establish Islam as the only religion. He will come on a white horse. He will be loved by all people on earth. Who is indwelled 
by the Logos, the eternal Logos, the Son who is eternally emitted from the Father alongside with the Holy Spirit. That is who Christ is, who came to earth as a humble servant and gave himself as an atoning sacrifice. for de the deliverance of all mankind if they would just gaze upon him as the Israelites gazed upon the serpent lifted up on a pole in the wilderness. Because God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, not to condemn the world, but to forgive it. So I pray that all of you watching, that Mr. Brown, that you find Christ and you submit to him so that you too can find your way to the Father because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's talking about how the Gentiles were duped into worshiping Jesus Christ. And he starts to <laughs> cite the Gnostics. Um, I, I, I'm having such a hard time wrapping my head around this, this notion of the Gnostics, the Freemasons, this secondary layer of, of the truth that is preserved in some sort of oral tradition surrounding Jesus. I mean, uh, they lack any ability to think deeper than two inches. So Lloyd, you and I did a video series talking about these mystery religions um, and how they painted Jesus as this mysterious figure and how they think Christianity is based in some sort of mystery religion. But uh, mm -hmm. now that we're going through this, you can actually see that Christianity is um, diametrically opposed to yeah. these Greek and Gnostic ideas. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And they will be the true scriptures which will be used by the Mahdi to show the Jews and the Christians they were wrong that their scriptures were the false scriptures. That's pretty strange if you've ever read the canonical Gospels. Apparently, this Jesus thinks that not even his own disciples know who he truly is. Also, what's up with him saying your God to his disciples as if they're worshiping something other than him or his heavenly father?
There was a second apocalypse of Peter, a Gnostic text that contained yet another scenario of the end times. But being Gnostic, it bore the stamp of heresy and therefore was forbidden. He calls bishops and deacons dry canals and he's trying to stake out authority for the Gnostic movement. Who's, who's, who's in doubt about it? Well, it's the Muslims who are in doubt about it, right? There's been no falter or folly on the lines of the Christians. The Islamic version of this man, they have no clue. It was either just someone was made to appear like him. It was Simon of Cyrene, maybe. It was one of Jesus' youngest followers. Um, it was uh, Judas, perhaps, that was on the cross. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. But the greatest feature of the Gnostic apocalypse of Peter is this description of the death of Jesus in which a human body is being crucified, but the real Christ is standing off to the side, laughing and mocking at this attempt to kill the Son of God. When of who's, who's, who's in doubt about it? Well, it's the Muslims who are in doubt about it. What? I did not die in reality, but in appearance. My death, which they think happened, happened to them in their error and blindness, since they nailed their man unto their death. Yes, they saw me. They punished me. <laughs> it was not I. But I was rejoicing in the height over all the wealth of the Archons and of their offspring, of their error and their empty judgment. And I was laughing at their ignorance. <laughs> all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Uh, and the Gospels are the first we hear of an earthly story for Jesus. The Gospels are wildly fictitious in their content and structure, uh, and, and, and more so than you probably even know. Uh, yesterday at, uh, uh, at the university campus at Raleigh, I did a whole lecture on this, and that will eventually be online, which you can watch where I explain why the Gospels are through and through myth. Uh, they, they're making everything up. Uh, I won't go any further into that uh, here. But every story in the Gospels has discernible allegorical or propagandistic intent. So it's clear that these are stories that they're making up. It looks like they're euhemerizing Jesus, putting him in history and making up stories about him, just as was done to every other celestial deity that we know about. And the first of these, Mark, in fact, looks like an extended meta-parable. Uh, outsiders are told one story, while insiders are told what it really means, what the real story is. And we have this, Mark even clues us in on this by having Jesus say, and when he was alone with his disciples, he said to them, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, outsiders, all these things are said in parables, so that seeing they may see but not perceive, and hearing they may hear but not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. This is a clue. He's basically saying uh, the, the whole gospel I'm writing is like this. It's a parable. Uh, to outsiders, it's going to look like a story of a historical Jesus. To insiders, it's full of rich uh, uh, allegorical and symbolic information. They don't like the story of Jesus dying on the cross because they lack any ability to think deeper than two inches. I'm having such a hard time wrapping my head around deeper than two inches. This this notion of the Gnostics, which makes sense that Islam is kind of a Gnostic-based religion any, anyway. He's over here talking about two different layers, secret layers, blah, blah, blah. That's just Gnostic nonsense. And this secondary layer of of the truth that is preserved in some sort of oral tradition surrounding Jesus. I mean, uh, that's just really, really, really bad historical um, understanding of coming to the truth of the matter, right?
that's just really, really, really bad historical um, understanding of coming to the truth of the matter. So when he was raised from death, his disciples remember that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and what Jesus had said. So when he was raised from death, his disciples remember that he had said this. And they believed the scripture and what Jesus had said. We would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Okay, pause. What's the context there? Well, in ancient Judaism, in Scripture, and in the New Testament, to sleep was a metaphor for death. So, in first century AD, they would use the euphemism of sleep. So, someone fell asleep was a way of describing the fact that they had died. So what's going on is that in the church of Thessalonica, some people have fallen asleep, they've died. And the Christians in that congregation who are converts from paganism, many of which don't have any solid beliefs or ideas about the afterlife. What's fascinating to me about this passage is, if you want a framework for understanding Paul's description of the parousia here, you should actually, surprise, surprise, go back to the Old Testament. Because if you look in the book of Exodus chapter 19, verse 16 through 20, Paul seems to actually be getting some of the images that he uses to describe the second coming from the account of God coming down from heaven on Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus chapter 19. And if you obey most of those upon the earth, they will mislead you from the way of Allah. They follow not except assumption, and they are not but falsifying. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. What he means is people who are living in the old creation under the power of sin and death and the devil. They're living according to the flesh according to the fallen world. They cannot please God. But you, now he's speaking to his Christian audience, are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. God, in that sense, in Genesis 1, makes the world through the power of water and the Spirit on the first day. Well then now, um, in the... Uh, in the resurrection, as Paul will say in the, his writings, Christ is raised through the power of the Spirit. He's drawn out of the waters of the baptism of his crucifixion. Right? He describes his crucifixion as a baptism, as an immersion in death, and he begins a new creation. And that's the same thing that's happening with the sacrament of baptism. So what happens when a person receives a sacrament of baptism, through the power of water and the Spirit, God is making you, making that individual, making that person into a new creation, into a new creation.
Rather, they have denied that which they encompass not in knowledge, and whose interpretation has not yet come to them. Nowhere does the Torah state that someone else's death can bring forgiveness to a person's sin. On the contrary, each man will be punished for his own sins, and each man must repent for his sins alone. The soul that sins, it shall die. Sons will not be punished for the sins of their fathers. The idea that someone else's death 2,000 years ago can somehow bring forgiveness from God for my sins is absurd and unfounded. What? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. Well, why then would he be baptized? Why would he go down into the symbolic river of death and as if he needed to die to his old life and come out new? Nag Hammadi obviously is the major find of Gnostic texts because prior to that most of the Gnostic beliefs were the ideas were found in the writings of early church fathers and others who wrote about them but a cache of major Gnostic texts was found in Nag Hammadi Egypt and thus these Gnostic ideas made their way back into the Western world and the whole heresy revived itself. He said Islam began as something strange and it shall return once again as something strange so I give good news of paradise to the strangers. Gnostic ideas made their way back into the Western world and the whole heresy revived itself. So this world and what is in it are accursed. Remember, the Gnostic idea is that the world of matter is evil. So the world is cursed except for sacred knowledge. Again, parallels mm -hmm. with Gnosticism, right? Now, Yahya ibn Abi Kathir said, studying sacred knowledge is a prayer. Sacred knowledge, okay, having sacred knowledge. What sacred knowledge? This is a prayer. And of course, there is nothing that is superior to seeking sacred knowledge. Very interesting. This is, again, within the, within the reliance of the traveler. Mm -hmm. Now, Wawi says, there are similar statements from whole groups of early Muslims I've not mentioned that are like those I've quoted, the upshot of which is that they concur that devoting one's time to sacred knowledge is better than devoting it to voluntary fasting or prayer, better than saying Subhan Allah, literally exalted is Allah above any limitation or any other devotions. Again, they're right. stating that the knowledge, the secret knowledge, the Nasis, is greater than the five pillars of Islam. The ulama, the people of knowledge, 
So related word, alim, fakih, ulama. Ulama, the term denoting scholars of almost all disciplines, although more specifically, scholars of the religious sciences. They're regarded as the guardians, the transmitters, and the interpreters of religious knowledge. Okay, so the second aspect of Genesis 1 that's important for this day is the fact that at the, on the first day of creation, what, what stands out is the presence of the Spirit and the presence of water, right? Now, I know some translations will say uh, the breath of God or the wind uh, was moving about, the wind of God was moving about over the face of the waters. And the reason they say that is because the Hebrew word here for Spirit, ruach, um, actually means breath, wind, and spirit. It means all three of those, okay? Another aspect of it, if you look at Genesis 1 verse 3, on that first day, on that Sunday, on that day of the world is made in Genesis 1, it also says, God said, let there be what? Light. Now, why does that matter? Well, if you recall from a few weeks back, when we were looking at the story of the man born blind, when Jesus heals the man born blind, we saw that the fathers interpreted that as a, as a prefiguration of the sacrament of baptism, where God, uh, where um, Jesus gives sight to the baptized, not physical sight, but spiritual sight, so that they can see that he is the light of the world. Well, when did the light of the world come into the world? It comes into the world on the first day in Genesis chapter 1. So when God says, let there be light, that's a prefiguration of the true light who's coming into the world to enlighten everyone, and that light is Christ. So once again, when a person is baptized at the Easter Vigil, they're receiving the light of Christ. The Bedouins say, we have believed. Say, you have not yet believed, but say instead, we have submitted, for faith has not yet entered your hearts. And if you obey Allah and his messenger, he will not deprive you from your deeds of anything. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. This is Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning one day, or some translations have the first day. And then, of course, as you know, it goes on to narrate over and over again that same refrain. There was evening, there was morning, a second day. There was evening, there was morning, a third day. There was evening, there was morning, a fourth day. All the way down to the sixth day on which God says in verse 26, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the cattle, over the creeping things, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, Male and female, he created them. So it, it climaxes with the creation of man and woman on the sixth day of creation. And then the account comes to an end in chapter 2, verse 1, which says this, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done.
So let one of you think deeply about the one he is taking his religion from. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Are they equal those who know and those who don't know? And when we substitute a verse in place of a verse, and Allah is most knowing of what He sends down, they say, You are but an inventor of lies, but most of them do not know.